This episode is brought to you by Playapod, the best cross-platform podcast app for iOS and Android. Just visit playapod.com and download it for free. Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories, where we play tales to take you away from today. On today's show, we have a ghost story that's in response to another ghost story. John from Alabama tells us all about it. I'll replay a condensed version of one of my favorite interviews of all time, and we have a Gunsmoke episode from their sponsorless era. More about that later. But as you know, it isn't a show without a five-minute mystery. Another five-minute mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by... The details. We all love a detailed story, but when it gets to be too much, it's too much. Or if you leave stuff out, we get confused and shrug. So let's get to our story and see what details we have today. They could be useful. Attention, Motorcycle Patrol 14. Attention, Motorcycle Patrol 14. Go immediately to Whaleback Beach. Body has been reported found on shore. Attention, Motorcycle Patrol 14. Hey, you! What are you doing down there? I'm the one who called the police. The body's down here. I'll be right down. Now, wait there. Take your time. That hill's pretty steep. <sighs> Is he dead? I'm afraid so. I've been trying to bring him around. Well, who is he? A neighbor of mine, John Rawlings. Uh, what's your name? Uh, William Sanders. I live uh, up the beach about a mile. Rawlings has the cottage next to mine. Well, what's happened here? Well, I'd just come in with my boat when I saw Rawlings sprawled on the sand. From the looks of him, he must have been in the water for several hours, as he had several strings of weed clinging to his wet clothes. I've been working on him while waiting for you. Uh, and he's gone, all right. Uh, poor Rawlings. I don't quite know how to break it to his wife. Uh, Mr. Sanders, um, where did you say you had been this afternoon? You mean when I discovered the body? Well, uh, before that. Well, I was out sailing all afternoon. I usually come in about five o'clock each afternoon, but since it was such a warm day, I made it an hour later. You were out all afternoon then? Yes, that's right. This evening, when I was sailing in, making for my anchor boy, I noticed what seemed to be a body lying on the beach. I anchored the ship and rowed in with my little boat that I keep tied up to the boy. Uh, where do you keep the rowboat when you're on shore? Oh, I also keep it out there. This line here, attached to the cliff, goes out to the boy, and after I row in, I use the line to pull the rowboat back out to the water. That's to keep the tides from smashing it on the rocks. You say you rowed right into the beach? Yes. Rawlings was lying high up on the sand. He must have been washed in by the high tide and left there when it ran out. How far out do you keep your sailboat? Well, when it's high tide, it's about 100 yards offshore. And at low tide? I should say about 50. When I came into shore tonight, it was only necessary for me to row in that distance, as it had been low tide for about four hours. Well, that'll be sufficient, Mr. Sanders. I have enough for my report. It's been a horrible accident. No, Mr. Sanders, you mean murder. What? I repeat, murder. And I'm holding you as the killer. <laughs> What flaw did the policeman discover in William Sanders' story that brands him as the murderer? In just a moment, we'll know, but first... Okay, that was a lot of detailed questioning that ends with an accusation of murder. Everything sounded good to me, but I'm guessing they left out some key detail that just might help us understand this one. You see, my problem is, I'm left wondering why, how, and when. <laughs> but hey, that's just me. This mystery is being brought to you by The Details, which we both lack and have in abundance. And now, back to our story. Uh, Mr. Sanders, your story contained one glaring contradiction that turned it into a confession of guilt. 
You told me that the body was wet when you found it. Yet just a moment ago, you admitted that the tide had been out for about four hours, thus leaving the body lying on the beach for that length of time in the summer sun. If Rawlings' body were wet, as you claimed you found it, it's because you just put it there after first drowning your victim. Sorry, Mr. Sanders, but your story sailed off course that time. Your alibi is on the rocks. One glaring problem, Mr. Policeman. How can you prove that he was the one that dragged the body up? Oh, and what was his motive again? We have so many details in this case, but they left out the most important one. Why? This five-minute mystery was brought to you by... The Details. I have to say that John Jackson from Mobile, Alabama, sent in this email. Love your podcast. That story you had about the kid and family that grew up in a haunted house reminded me of my one scary story. I work as a cable tech, which means I see a lot of attics and basements. I once went into a basement that I still have nightmares about it. There was a single pole string type light in the center of the room, so I really couldn't see much until I turned it on. Now, I'm used to dark basements, but I was not prepared for what I saw. What I saw was that the walls down the stairway were covered in old newspapers. All of the articles were about some tragedy or a murder. There was a black and white framed picture on the wall of an old man who looked quite dead. And below that was a large child-sized porcelain doll propped up in a rocking chair. Next to it, an odd-looking cradle. I went about doing my job, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I began testing all of the connections as a final check. Suddenly, my meter went completely dead and the light bulb blew out. I heard a voice say, Get out now. I didn't have to be asked twice, and I ran upstairs never to return. The house owner greeted me as I came through the basement door. I guess she knew something was wrong and asked, Everything okay? I told her what had happened, and she told me that she knew about that, and that's why they never go down there. I left that house hoping that their cable was working because I will never come back to troubleshoot it. John from Alabama. Well, thank you for that one, John. I did some cable installation during my college years. I once wired up an entire firehouse with Cat4 cable. Nothing happened other than for a few days, at least, I got to see what life was really like in a firehouse. Not what you would expect. The story you were referring to was from episode 311, as told by Jim Sweeney. That was some crazy stuff. Thank you again, John. I loved your story. Now, if you have a story and want to share it on Ron's Amazing Stories, now's the time to do it. All you have to do is go to ronsamazingstories.com and click on the Contact tab. Start typing, and the next thing you know... You'll be hearing your story on the show. Do it today. I remember one of the first books I ever read. It was a hand-me-down from my brother called The Mystery of the Whale Tattoo. It came from the Hardy Boys series by Franklin W. Dixon. After I finished that book, I grabbed the next one in the series and I never looked back. The next big novel I recall reading which impacted me was Rendezvous with Rama by Arthur C. Clarke. This inspired me to read a whole lot more of his works and other great science fiction novels. Then in the 90s, I found a whole new genre of books called fantasy. One of the first of these was titled The Crystal Shard by R.A. Salvatore. 
I was so impressed by how rich the world was and how alive the characters were that this sent me into a frenzy of reading and I became a fan. Fast forward some 20 plus years and I'm still reading fantasy and of course, R.A.'s work. In August of 2012, I had the pleasure of talking to Mr. Salvatore. I thought that this week I would bring back a best of that show. Edited, here is that interview. I want to welcome to the podcast Mr. R.A. Salvatore. He is one of the fantasy genre's most successful authors. His books regularly appear on the New York Times bestseller list and have sold more than 10 million copies in the U.S. alone. R.A. is here to talk about his newest book from the Neverwinter Saga, Charon's Claw. Welcome to the podcast, Bob. Good to be here. First, let me say that it's a real pleasure to have you on the show. And I wanted to start off with something that we both have in common. Um, we have been a, a member of a gaming group for a very long time. Uh, my group is approaching its 25th year, and I believe yours is even older. Um, I'm trying to think back. I don't think any well, one of the original members is still there. Um, but we've got children of another one and <laughs> my kids are in it now. And yeah, we started in 1980, 81, mm -hmm. still get together. So have any of your story ideas come from that group? Not really the story ideas, but small anecdotes. Um, we have one guy who was like the quintessential dwarf who used to, um, strap. He was a cleric, always played a dwarven cleric. He would strap, uh, a keg of oil to his back, cast <laughs> this fire on himself and then, kind of go into battle with a bang. You know, little things like that find their way into the books. They're just too good to keep out. But generally speaking, I keep the gaming and the writing separate. Yeah. Um, so the For Forgotten Realms is D&D's largest and probably oldest worlds. Uh, did, you have an, did your group have any impact on that, helping to develop that? Um, well, first of all, I think Dragonlance is older. Well, it's oh. hard to say. It's hard to say because Ed was doing Dragon Magazine articles for the Forgotten Realms, but it didn't really become formally a game world until 1987, so it's 25 years old. Mm -hmm. um, Dragonlance was earlier than that, and Greyhawk, I think, was the first one for D&D, &D, mm -hmm. the Gygax, Arneson world of Greyhawk. Um, but my my group has done a module uh, we, when I had a company called Seven Swords, which was really my gaming group. We did a module called the Accursed Tower for the Forgotten Realms. But other than that, not really. Hmm. So you incorporated then basically the books into the Forgotten Realms. Is that how it happened, or is it? No, I, I had written a book and I sent it to TSR back in 1987, and they said. Um, you know, really like this, but we have no room to publish it. Um, we only have room on a schedule for Forgotten Realms books. Would you like to audition for one of those? And I said, what are the Forgotten Realms? Because they weren't out yet. This mm -hmm. was early in the year that they hadn't been published yet. And they told me about the realms. I said, sure. And I auditioned, and then I won the contract in July. It was uh, 25 years ago this month. I won the contract wow. through the Crystal Shard. And that, that was the Icewind Dale trilogy. And, right. Uh, uh, which, which for me was when I started reading was about 1990. And I, I have, like I mentioned, I'm a big fan of your novels and short stories. And I came across a reference that I thought would be the perfect place to learn more about you. And, uh, the question is, what can you tell me about the blizzard of 1978? <laughs> well, it changed my life. I uh, think it did. Yes. I was a freshman in college up here in Massachusetts and I was living at home. I was commuting to school. And for Christmas of 1977, my sister gave me a copy of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And I was really ticked off because, first of all, I was a math major. And I, and I wasn't – school had beaten the reading out of me. I didn't want to read books. I wanted money. I had a car that broke down all the time, and I had to get to school. Um, so I wanted money, and she gave me books. I'm thinking, what am I going to do with these? So I just put them aside and didn't think anything more of it. And then two months later, in February of 1978, we had the great blizzard of 78 up here in New England. And it hit right at rush hour. I remember it was, it was a Monday night, and I went to bed, and we had been told we might get a little snow. Um, and the next day I got up, and my car was buried. 
top to bottom. I mean, we got dumped on every, everywhere out here. And, and the storm really hit right at rush hour. And the, it put a lot of people in a bad place. So the roads were all closed all week. You were not allowed on the road. Hmm. And so, of course, I had no school for the week. There was no internet in 1978. Um, there were three channels on the TV that came in. And they, all they were showing was blizzard coverage. So I was stuck in my mother's house at the age of 19 with nothing to do and was thinking, oh, this is fun. But then I found out I wasn't stuck there. And I went to a place called Middle Earth with, with a hobbit named Baggins. And I remembered what it was like to, to read and love what I was reading, not the stuff they were giving me in school. But when I was much younger and, you know, first grade, second grade, I used to read all the time. And I remembered what that felt like suddenly. And so I just started I went back to school and changed my major to communications because then all of my electives became literature courses and it just changed my life. I fell in love and I fell in love with the fantasy genre. And so when I ran out of books to read in fantasy around 1981, there weren't that many back then. It's not like now, now you could read fantasy books every minute of every day for the rest of your life and never get through them all. Oh, that's for sure. It wasn't like that in 1978. I mean, there was Tolkien and then Brooks came out and Donaldson soon after and Moorcock and Anne McCaffrey. And, um, you know, there just weren't that many. So I had pretty much read all I could find. And again, there was no internet. So you couldn't go searching around the internet for it. You were at the mercy of your local bookstore. And, um, when I ran out of books to read, I wrote one. And that was the book that got me the edition at, at, uh, TSR back in 1987. Hmm. So the blizzard worked. It helped. (laughs) Well, you know, I came across that and I just figured that was going to be, you know, a great place for us to start. Um, one of the questions that I've always wanted to ask you, and, and it, it comes from reading a lot of, uh, Driss novels, Duart, Driss Duarte novels. And one of the things that I'm always impressed with is the combat and how well it's written. And I have a friend that told me, he actually didn't even give me a choice. He said, I have to ask if you have a martial arts or combat skill background. I paid my way through college as a bouncer in a local nightclub. Really? Really. And, and is I that where you hockey, get your so. fighting techniques from? And- yeah, well, I play hockey, too. So, you know, the curved blades kind of come in there. Huh. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I, I've been an athlete most of my life, and, and I've been a um, – I love watching sports. I love watching boxing with the old Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier matches. Every week on the wide world of sports, you could watch um, Jerry Quarry get beat up by somebody. Um <laughs> Mm-hmm. And, you know, so I, I, I'm, I'm an observer. I watched it. I, um, I did some martial arts training and I was a bouncer. Like I said, for years, I was a boxer when I was in high school. Ah. I, we had a boxing club, just a few friends, and we'd kind of go in one guy's basement and beat the tire out of each other. Um, and, you know, the, you learn, there's certain things you learn when you're in fights that, aren't really evident to people who haven't been in fights. And for example, where your feet are is more important than where your hands are most of the time. Mm-hmm. It's all about balance. It's all about, you know, for power is all about balance and being able to take a hit. It's all about balance and just the emotions that go through your head when you're in a fight, mostly that kind of red that just fills your eyes. Mm-hmm. And um, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not a fan of getting in fights and I haven't, I, I don't go around looking for trouble and haven't been in a fight and, more than 30 years and don't intend to ever get in a fight in my life again. And when I was a bouncer, I wouldn't agree. When I was a bouncer, I used to try to talk people out of it. I didn't want to hit anyone and I didn't want to get hit, but you know, I learned, I I studied and I trained and I, and I learned how to handle myself. And, um, I just, so when I'm doing it, I, I just, I watch the battle in my head. I think where should his feet be for him to make the next best move? And that's how I go about it. Hmm. Well, it really shows in, in the stories that, uh, you know, you've always been told you write what you know. And and it, it comes through in the stories that, that they're just perfectly handled. And you can see it in my head when I'm when I'm reading the books. Well, I love it when I get an email from someone who, um, you know, is a is a black belt in martial arts and knows much more than I do and says that's exactly the way it would go. That was perfect. 
you know, I think I think if I wasn't a writer, I'd probably be choreographing battle scenes for movies or something. Hmm. I don't know. It, it's just it's it's. I don't know how that happened. I'm I'm really glad it did. One of my frustrations in reading, uh, particularly a lot of the older fantasy novels, is as wonderful as as I found them. They always they never showed you the fights. Mm-mm. They kind of told you what happened after the fights or what someone was thinking during the fight or like with the one move that killed someone. But they, I remember reading the wish song of Shannon and I love Terry Brooks, oh, but yes. it, one of my yeah, Garrett Jack's up on the ledge fighting the Damon, and, and the next thing you know, he's sitting there all battered and beaten and it was an epic battle that he never showed you. And it's like, I've always yelled at Terry about that because I want to see the battle. It's like when I'm watching movies, I, you know, the fight scenes, the chase scenes, the, the, these things matter. And, um, especially for an audience, I think, and for a writer like me who grew up with television and movies more Mm -hmm. than books, the being able to get someone's pulse pounding while they're watching that battle scene in their head is something that I always felt was very important. And a lot of people weren't doing it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I went there. (laughs) Well, and something that kind of goes with that is one of the things that I also like in your work is, is how you develop your characters. A lot of times authors will spend boring amounts of time telling us how great their main character is, but you don't do that. In fact, you let the characters tell us by their actions or any actions who they are. I'm guessing that's not by accident. Well, there's an absolute reason for that. And the reason for that is I don't know who the characters are when I start writing. They tell me as we go. Mm-hmm. You know, when I put when I put Dritz into the Crystal Shard, he wasn't in the original outline of the Crystal Shard, and he kind of wound up in there by accident because I needed a sidekick for Wolfgar. Mm-hmm. And so I started writing the first scene where Dritz is running across the tundra and he gets jumped by the Yetis, and I just knew it was his book. I didn't know why. I just knew this is his book. And who is this guy? I want to get to know this guy. And then, you know, similarly, at the end of the book, I wa- I really enjoyed writing it, and I wanted TSR to give me another book. So I put the hook in at the end of the book where Regis goes to Bryn Shander in Ten Towns, goes into the city, and he sees this guy there with a jeweled dagger. And I don't really, I don't, I don't describe him in depth. I just talk about Regis saw that. He knew who it was, and I'm just telling you how Regis feels about this guy. And that was Adamus Centrary. I didn't know that was Adamus Centrary. I didn't know who he was. And... I just knew that it was a good hook for another book. And then I started writing Streams of Silver, and all of a sudden I started discovering this character of Adamus and Trary. And I realized that what he really is is who Dritz might have been if he had never escaped Menzo Baron's on. And so, yeah, I mean, look, this whole thing for 25 years has been a personal journey for me where I use my books to ask myself all the questions and try to find the answers for myself. And I do that reflecting it through the characters, all the characters, the good guys, the bad guys, the big characters, the little characters off to the side. That's how I do it. When I sit down and write a book, I've got an outline because I'm required to. They they aren't going to send me my check without one. So I give them the outline. I start writing the book and I throw the outline away and the characters take over and they tell me what's going on. A lot of times I don't know what's going to happen on the next page. That's what keeps me writing. Characters surprise me. Um, and if they surprise me, rather than saying, oh, he wouldn't do that or she wouldn't do that, I try to figure out why they did that. Because for some reason, the char- it's weird, but for some reason, somewhere deep in my head, the character did that for a reason. Now I have to go figure out why. Hmm. So these, these books are like an exploration. So I couldn't tell you all about the characters at the beginning if I wanted to. I don't know who they are. Wow. So it, it's my best guess that there are at least 23 Drist novels now. Is that pretty accurate or oh i think it's probably more than that i think if you add in i mean when i say dritz novel i think of all my forgotten realms books mm. and that includes the cleric quintet because catherly and dritz cross paths many times oh, yeah. includes the stone of tomorrow books i wrote with my son so if i sat back and thought about it for a minute let me think about it i've got the icewind dale uh, dark elf legacy of the drow so that's 10 uh, Paths of Darkness is 13, Cell Swords is 16, oh uh, boy, um, Hunter's Blades 19, Transition is 22, Gauntlegrim 23, Neverwinter 24, Karen's Claw 25, Son of Tomorrow 28, Clarence Clinton Head 33. 
mm. 3v3. Wow. A lot of books. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of books. W- w- when you created the character, did you have any idea that he was going to be the cornerstone of just about everything? He just wanted to get a second book contract. <laughs> I had no idea. I didn't, this thing is, I didn't even, I didn't even start writing wanting to be a writer. I started writing because I ran out of books to read. Mm-hmm. So I wrote Echoes of the Fourth Magic in 1983 because I ran out of books to read. And then I said, some people, some of my friends read and said, this is really good. You should get this published. And I tried to get it published and I got some awful rejection letters. So I spent the next four years working on the book while I was, you know, building a career and building a family. Mm-hmm. And then, um, in 1987, I sent that book to TSR it was one of the places I sent it. They were doing the Dragonlance books and they needed us. They needed a second Forgotten Realms author and they liked the book and they asked me to audition. So in June of that year, I auditioned in July of that year. 25 years ago, I, I won the contract for the Crystal Shard. This this found me. I didn't seek it. Hmm. It's been a bizarre journey. And um, so, no, I, I had no idea. I, I just knew when I started writing about that character and he's running across the tundra that I found him interested, interesting. And so I was going to focus on him for the book. And I had no idea that any of this would happen. Wow. So let's talk about the newest book. It comes from the Neverwinter Saga and is the third in the series. Yeah, of third course, of it should four. come as no surprise that it's a Driss Du Arden novel. Yeah, and it's the third of four, by the way. Oh, it's there's four? Well, there is now. I, I already finished the next book in the series, oh. and we decided it would fit really nicely with these three that I had done for Neverwinter, so we expanded Neverwinter to four books. At least that's what I was told. Yeah. So. Hmm. Well, in the last novel, we kind of left Drist in a very dark place, struggling with his morals. What can you tell us about the new Chronicle? Um, more of that uh, for him. I mean, this this series, the the cake of this series, is the all of a sudden Drist finds himself alone and afraid, and the world has changed. It's gotten darker, and he's questioning whether or not his life has been like a, a sad joke. And now suddenly finds himself, you know, intrigued and attracted to Dahlia, who is a very flawed character, borderline crazy mm-hmm. flawed character. And sure enough, you know, uh, another the one tie he has left to the past is a person of great moral ambiguity at best. So all of a sudden, Driss is finding himself surrounded by people whose values do not reflect his own. Where for all of the other books before this, he was surrounded by people who would take an arrow for him. These people will pull him in front of an arrow aimed for them. Wow, yeah. So the question becomes, it's like the kid that falls in with a bad crowd in high school, right? The question becomes, is he going to lift them up or are they going to drag him down? Hmm. And the other question he needs to answer to himself is that whole thing that in Ovindil, the elf that he knew in the silver matches posed to him in the lone drow about what it is to be an elf, where she told him the only way he keeps his sanity is to live his life in shorter spans, the way a human might, you know, if he's going to live for centuries, he can't be dwelling on the people that he might lose. If he has friends who are humans and dwarves and halflings and he isn't killed by an enemy, he's going to outlive them by hundreds of years. Hmm. And the only way he'll be able to do that, and not lose his mind is to then begin his life anew, kind of recreate himself. So here he is finding that painfully. So after, um, after Gontelgrim and now he's surrounded by people of a different moral code and he can't deny his attraction to Dahlia, but he knows she's no caddy Brie. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's a book of it's a book where he's really questioning himself and questioning the value of those things he held dear. You know, all his life, he he thought community, law and order, community over individual, you know, all of those values. And now he's finding people who are robbers out on the road, because if they're not, you know, society has abandoned them. If they're not stealing out on the road, they're starving. So that's, there's a lot of moral ambiguity there, kind of a Les Miserables thing going on. And in the face of all of that, how could Dritz not but question? Hmm. So another new beginning for him. 
maybe. <laughs> maybe not, huh? Or maybe the beginning of the end. You never know. Yeah, that's true. So can you tell us anything about what might be coming then? No. Ah, uh, I didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have to read and find out. Oh, of course. Um, I guess. How I'd, many authors would ruin the next book? None of them. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But I figured I'd ask anyway. Sure. <laughs> I'd like to ask if people want to find out more about you or your books, where can they go? Well, you can always go to rasalvatore.com. That website's been around for a long time. We actually do e-signings over there where people can buy the books and get them signed and personalized. Um, and I also have a Facebook page at um, R, capital R period, capital A period, space Salvatore on Facebook. Um, there's like, I don't know, 105,000 people over there, or some silly number. And, um, you know, I, I try to update that fairly regularly. And um, it's a good group of folks and I'm out there. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time and, and uh, talking with us here on Ron's amazing stories. It is a been a pleasure to have you on. Oh, good to be here. Thanks for your interest. Appreciate it. What a pleasure it was to do that interview. I would love to have more authors like R.A. on the show, but it took me over a year to get that one set up. I remember when I finally got the email giving me the date we re-record. First, I was very excited, and then I felt full-on fear. I was going to talk to my hero, R.A. Salvatore. The day of the interview, I was put into a queue of folks who would talk with him that day. His publicist told me that I would have seven minutes with him, so keep the question short. Well, we talked for over 30 minutes. The entire time I was interviewing Bob, it kept running through my head. That's R.A. Salvatore. I'm talking to R.A. Salvatore. R.A. Salvatore! After the interview, I decided to tell him just how nervous I was. He told me about the very first time he met George Lucas, and in the end, he was just a guy. A cool guy, but just a guy. I wish I'd heard that before we had started. In the end, what I found out was Bob Salvador was a cool guy. Thanks, Bob. This will always be one of my favorite interviews. If you want to hear that interview in its entirety, it can be found on the Ron's Amazing Stories archive page. There is a link to that page at ronsamazingstories.com or just search on archive.org. It's episode number 68. And now this. Our OTR story for this week comes from one of those long-running classic old-time radio shows that everyone knows and remembers. It's also one that is still respected for its high values in all aspects. Gunsmoke first aired on CBS Network on April 26, 1952, and it was billed as the first adult western. The story I have for you this time is called the bear trap. Usually Gunsmoke titles give away what the story is about. I guarantee that is not the case for this one. Please enjoy Bear Trap, which first aired on April 21st, 1957. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. And that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. And the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man. Matt Dillon, the United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job. 
And it makes a man watchful. And a little lonely. Marshal's closed up the stable and gone home for the night, Mr. Jones. Well, Andy Weaver must be around, though. He always is. Don't see no sign of him. Well, I'll... Oh. I'll, I'll open the door and we can get the horses inside, at least. Yeah. All right. Yes, sir. I declare I'm so tired I could lay right down the stall and sleep with my horse. The way you roll around, the horse would get a worse kicking than you would. And now, the only time I toss much is when I've had something that don't set right with me. It ain't too often I do that. No, sure isn't. Say, we're going to have to bed these horses down ourselves, Mr. Dillon? No, Andy will do it. He's probably in the back room. Come on, let's go see. I declare I just couldn't have rode another mile tonight. Well, it was either ride to Sorry, Dodge or to camp out. I can prove it to you, too. Hey, listen, boys that about sounds it. sounds like Andy's got somebody with him. And they will, too. Mm-hmm. Andy, talking to himself more than likely. Just oh, keep awake. Sure. Well, a livery Nothing stable sure. doesn't need much of a night watchman now, anyway, I guess. Well, I'm not saying I don't believe it, Andrew, but I'm not saying that I do believe it. That's old Miles McTagg with him. (laughs) Well, the two biggest liars in Dodge are at it again. All they need now is Doc. Black Hill. Andy never even seen the Black Hill. I know that. And then them Indians jumped on me. A dozen and a half of them. A whooping and a hollering and a shooting their arrows. I seen I only had one chance, so I spurred my horse and I rode for the timber. <laughs> that dog on the little liar. He got that story out of Ned Buntline. One of the boys we had in jail one time read it to In five minutes, them two trees were so full of arrows, they looked like porcupines. And when the fight was over, there was 14 Indians laying dead all around me. The other two got away while I was reloading. Well, that's only 16. You said there was a dozen and a half. Well, that's only a matter of speaking. Sixteen's the same as a dozen and a half. Aha! No, it is not. It lacks two. Eighteen's a dozen and a half. Now, <laughs> let's go on and say hello, Chester. All right, you. Oh, dang it, Miles. I told you. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, Marshal. Evening, Eddie. Oh. Miles. Good evening, Matthew. Chester. Oh, Mr. McTagg. Well, what's the matter, Andy? Well, uh, opening the door that way, sudden like it. <laughs> Oh, God dang it, Marshal, you ought to knock first. Why, my land, an old Indian fighter like you hadn't ought to get spooked over nothing that happened, now, Andy. You, you shut up, Chester. I know what I know. Yeah, too bad there ain't nobody else does. Yeah, <laughs> one of them boys will come through here someday. You believe me, don't you, Marshal? Well, Andy, all that was a long time ago. Oh, you, you doubt my word, is that it? <sighs> no, I didn't say I doubted your word, Andy. Oh, and it's all right, Marshal, I... Maybe it's best just to forget it. No, now, I was just funning you, yeah, and it's sure, Chester, I, I know. Well, I, I better get your horses unsaddled and bedded down. Uh, Andy, why don't you let them cool some before you water them, huh? Yes, sir. Oh, that's a pity, Matthew. He's a fine-hearted old man. It's a shame he's so prone to prevaricate. Well, he's like a lot of us, Miles. He tells about the things he wishes he'd done, wishes he had the courage to do. Marshal. Yeah, what is it, Andy? There's somebody here. It's... uh, Evening, Marshal. Chester. Hard Logan. I didn't know you were out, hon. You have been paroled? A week ago, Marshal. Two years, seven months. Parole. Don't ever go to prison, Marshal. It's no good. Yeah, so I hear. You traveling with the Beckett brothers again? Now, Marshal, the warden told me to stay away from evil companions. Uh Uh-huh. Of course, the Beckett boys ain't evil officially. They didn't go to prison. Andy here didn't identify them like he done me. Well, I I only told the truth, Hodge. Sure you did, Andy. Stood right up there in court and told him you seen me run out of the bank. Told him I was wearing a mask, but it slipped and you seen my face. Yeah, I, I, I did. It was right brave of you, Andy. Downright brave. And now I'm back. And you, you better leave me alone, Hod. You better not bother me. 
What are your plans, Hud? Oh, I reckon I'll hang around Dodge a while, Marshal. Look up my old friends. Drop in and pass the time with Andy here once in a while. No, no, no. You, you stay away from me. No, that ain't being very kind to a man who's paid his debt, Andy. It's only paid up till now, Hud. Don't go open up a new account. Now, it's a funny thing, Marshal. Man can't always plan too far ahead. You don't always know just how things are going to work out. There's the Long Branch, right there ahead of us. Yeah. It's always been there as far as I remember, Chester. Well, yes, sir, I know, but as long as we're passing it anyhow, don't you reckon we might as well look in for a minute? Oh, no, what for? Well, my land to say hello to whoever's in there. <laughs> like Sam Nolan, for instance? Well, yeah, Sam. Anybody else, too, of course. What's the matter with you? You got a dime that's burning a hole in your pocket. <laughs> I could do with a glass of beer, as far as that's concerned. Uh, all right, Chester, but uh, I'm not going to stay long. I want to go see the doc. Well, maybe he's in there. Uh, no, no, the light's burning in his office. Come on in out of the weather. Whatever they use for weather this time of year. You like a drink? Well, I think Chester's got a beer in mind, yeah. Uh, well, see, the truth is, I thought as long as I was here, I'd get me a glass of rye with a little dab of sugar in it. <laughs> for that matter, I think I'll just go get it while I got the chance. <laughs> Sam? Now, the place looks real quiet tonight. Yeah, too quiet, man. That's good for you, I guess. Not for me. Ah, business will pick up. The rains are about over now. The trail herds will be rolling in before long. Well, something better happen, or Sam and I'll have to start taking in each other's wash to make a living. <laughs> I can't quite see you taking in wash, Kitty. You know something, Matt? Neither can I. Come on, have one on me this time. Well, I won't help business, honey. Well, it looks like business anyway. <laughs> Hey, hey, wait a minute, Kitty. Hmm? What is it, Matt? What's he doing over there? Randy? Yeah, he's supposed to be holding on the night watchman's job over at the livery stable. Oh, I don't know. He's been here for about an hour. He's wearing a gun, too. Look, uh, Kitty, I'll take you up on that offer a little later. Huh? Sure, Matt. Anytime. I'll be around. <laughs> Hello, Andy. Oh, how's it oh, going? Oh, now you kind of snuck up on me there. Yeah. Uh-huh. The uh, stable running itself tonight? No, no. I I was just going over. I uh, just uh, fixing to leave. I see. I, uh, 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 Marshal. Yeah. Marshal Hod Hod Logan seemed to kill me. Did he say so, Andy? He he don't say nothing. At least mostly don't. He's just there, is all. Four or five times a night. Every night this week. At the stable? Yeah. Well, why? Well, looking in on his horse, he says. He's keeping it there. But that ain't why he hangs around, Marshal. He's fixing to kill me. That's what he's doing. How do you know, Andy? You just told me that he never said anything. Well, he don't have to. It's the way he looks. Just a grin and not saying nothing. Last night, kind of late it was, I, I went out the back door toward the corral. There he was, leaning against the post, just a grinning at me. Is that why you took to wearing a gun? Oh, I got to, Marshal. He's, he's aiming to kill me. Well, if he is, the gun won't stop him. You wouldn't have a chance against Hot Logan. Well, then, uh, what, what, what am I going to do, Marshal? First thing is to stop letting him get your goat. Well, I can't help it. I ain't no gunfighter. 
All them tall stories that I've been telling, I, I never done nothing like that. Well, then don't start anything now, not with Hart. That's what he wants you to do, so he'll have an excuse. An excuse for what? Uh, you've already said it, Andy. An excuse to kill you. See how this is coming along, Matt. Oh, yes, we got to get those stitches out. Uh, can you roll that sleeve up a little higher? Well, if I do, I'll choke myself, but I'll try. Mm-hmm. Uh, how's that, Doc? Fine, fine, fine. <clears throat> fine. Yes, that seems to be healing all right. Yeah, huh? That's a sign of good blood. Isn't oh, it? your blood's all right, I reckon. What you got left of it? <laughs> what you got left of it? Bullet wounds, nothing but bullet wounds since I came out here to this blasted frontier. You know, man, it'd be a downright pleasure to treat a plain, oh, say a bellyache, a nice case of the gout. You wouldn't know what to do with a civilized practice, yeah, Doc, kind you of know it. It'd be kind of nice to find out, though. Now, you want to brace yourself kind of here, man. I got to get those stitches out. Well, now. go ahead. I got a hold of them now, so I just wanted it. To... <laughs> <laughs> What did you do? Sew them through the bone? Well, you're lucky you got a bone there. An inch to the right and you wouldn't have. So why don't you steer clear of some of these gunmen, Matt? And I will if they'll stay clear of Dodge. <coughs> That's two of them, huh? Yeah. Oh, see, I understand Hod Logan is back. Yeah, he's been hanging around town for about a week. I thought maybe he'd head on west and try to find the Beckett brothers. Yeah, those Beckett brothers. They were pretty thick, weren't they, for a while? Before Hard went to prison. Uh, they ought to have gone, too, but we didn't have enough case against them. <clears throat> Hurts, doesn't it? <laughs> Doc, if you were up around my mouth, I'd swear you were pulling teeth instead of stitches. Well, you didn't beller when I sewed you up. <laughs> yeah, but you gave me a half a bottle of whiskey that time. Mr. Dillon? Uh, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? It's them Beckett's, Mr. Dillon. Huh? They're back in town. Somebody's seen them about an hour ago. Uh... Doc, the rest of these will have to wait. I want to go talk to them before they meet too many old friends. Logan took his horse out of the stable two hours ago, and he checked out of the Dodge house. Maybe they've all hit the trail together. No, they're still in town somewhere. Well, there's no reason to expect them to try something the minute they get together, are they? Why not? That's what Hod's been waiting around for. I couldn't figure him wasting a week like that just to get even with Andy Wimmer. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. What's the matter? I was just thinking... Now, Hod's been hanging around the stable there at odd hours of the night. I figured that he was just trying to prod Andy into drawing on him, but... Yeah, that might be something else. Uh, Chester, let's take a walk down between the stable and the general store, huh? All right. You know, all Andy ought to clean up some of this junk in the doggone fire has. Hey, quiet, Chester. Yes, sir. Careful, watch it. What is it? A broken glass. Don't step on it, it'll make a noise. Mm-hmm. Hey, look. Somebody's busted open the window on the side of the store there. They've tore all the boards off. Yeah. So that's why Hod was hanging around the stable. People would get used to seeing him and not think nothing of it. That's what your man in. Right? They're inside the store. They're inside the store. Yeah. Probably after Jonas is safe, you could bust it open with a crowbar. 
They're going to be mighty spry when they find us waiting for them here. We're not going to be waiting for them. Why not? I'm not sure that all three of them are in there. One of them might be out back of the stable with their horses. Now, look, you go back out to the street and go across to the long branch and get Sam Noonan to help you, and you wait there. And if Hod and the Beckett's come out that way, you stop them. Well, now, they ain't coming out the front with you. You know it. You do as I tell you. I'm going to be back in the stable. Yes, sir. But you be careful, Mr. Young. Well, Hard. It's not hard, you crazy fool. Marshal. Keep your voice down. Oh, first, I'm mighty sorry. I put them traps there for Hard Logan so he couldn't sneak into the back of the stable. Well, get a trap setter and open this thing, will you? Yes, sir, right away. I got one hit up there with that water barrel. Hey, yeah, that's Hard Logan. Let's get to the horses and ride out of here. He's up there between the stable and the store. Be quiet. Here. Let me roll over and we'll get my gun clear. First, and I'll take time to finish the land we Stand where you are, Hard. What? You're under arrest. Get your hands up. Get back to the building. You haven't got a chance, Hard. Now, come on out. Come and get us, Marshal. We got to get undercover, Marshal. We're right out here in plain sight. Then get that setter and open this trap. I can hold them in back of the building. They can't get a shot at me without stepping out under the open. He's caught in one of them bear traps, boys. Stepped on one of them traps we seen Andy set to this afternoon. You take one step from behind that building, Hard, and it'll be your last one. Don't have to take a step, Marshal. Just toss a match, is all. Toss a match? Hey, he's going to set fire to the straw. Oh, he, you were burned to death, Marshal. I'll try and find something to force that trap open. No, there's no time for that. Look that barrel of water there. Run out and tip it over, will you? Well, that's right by the corner of the building. I can't go out there. There ain't much cover. Here, take my gun. And go out shooting. It'll keep them off balance. Now, hurry. That fire's going to get oh, close. I, I can't, Marshal. They'll kill me. Look, Andy, they aim to kill you before they leave anyway. Hard wants to get even with you. Now, go on. I can't. I, I just can't go out there, Marshal. I can't. All right, Andy. Just get clear, then. No use of you burning, too. Oh, no. I... Oh, it ain't no use, Marshal. I, I can't do that, neither. I can't leave you here. Here. Give me your gun, Marshal. Here. Good luck. It's Andy. Get him, boy. Andy, dump that barrel over. I've got it, Marshal. <coughs> I've done it, Marshal. I've done it. I've done just like you told me. And I think maybe I got hard and one other. The third man got away. Oh, we'll get him, all right. Now go get that trap setter. I got it. I brought it back with me. I stood right up to him, gun to gun, didn't I, Marshal? Yeah, you sure did, Andy. Now hurry it up, will you? Here. Uh. 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 Well, Andy, you can forget about that Indian story now. I think this one's better. And I'll sure be around to back you up. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Featured in the cast were Parley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. George Walsh speaking.
Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on Gunsmoke. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. That was a shorter story than most. It came from a time when Gunsmoke was running in syndication and didn't have a sponsor. The shows were sold individually to radio stations, although CBS still held the rights to them. They would run in a time slot, and commercials that ran with the show were most likely local. Series producers felt that if the show was sponsored, they would have to clean it up. So the producers wanted to find a sponsor that would allow them to keep the show the way it was. I, for one, am glad they did. That is the show, and I hope you enjoyed it. I fought hard with myself about replaying the interview today. I almost didn't do it. Still no word on the Horror Express. Jason is back to work, but is struggling some. His own words, I want to be at my best for the show. Get better, my friend. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, it's easy to do. Just head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you're going to find all of the links you'll need. We are on Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many other services. Pick one and do leave some feedback about the show. It really does help us to grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com. This episode is brought to you by Playapod, the best cross-platform podcast app for iOS and Android. Just visit playapod.com and download it for free.